Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together again after a little hiatus. It is the fourth, the fourth Yom or day of the 10th month on our Creator's calendar. We also have, ooh, I think it's the 16th of the 10th month on the Gregorian calendar. Please forgive me if I'm mistaken. But we are continuing in our reading of the recognitions of Clement. And we're at the end of Kepha reciting from creation until their current times, where he's about to begin his discourse with Simon the Magician. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. This is chapter 17. It's titled, Men Enemies to Yahuwah. But inasmuch as inborn affection towards Yahuwah the Creator seemed to suffice for deliverance to those who loved him, the enemy studies to pervert this affection in men and to render to the or sorry and to render them hostile and ungrateful to their creator. For I call Shemaim and Earth to witness that if Yahuwah permitted the enemy to rage as much as he desires, all men should have perished long ere now. But for his loving kindness sake, Yahuwah does not suffer him. But if men would turn their affection towards Yahuwah, all would doubtless be delivered, even if for some faults they might seem to be corrected for righteousness. But now the most of men have been made enemies of Yahuwah, whose hearts the immoral one has entered and has turned aside towards himself the affection that Yahuwah the Creator had implanted in them, that they might have it towards him. But of the rest who seemed for a time to be watchful, the enemy appearing in a vision of esteem and splendor and promising them certain great and mighty things, has caused their mind and heart to wander away from Yahuwah. Yet it is for some righteous reason that he is permitted to accomplish these things. <clears throat> Chapter 18 or 28, Responsibility of Men. To this Achilla, which is Latin for eagle, by the way, to this, Aquila answered, How then are men in fault if the immoral one, transforming himself into the brightness of light, promises to men greater things than the Creator himself does? Then Kepha answered, I think, says he, that nothing is more unrighteous than this. And now listen while I tell you how unrighteous it is. If your son, whom you have trained and nourished with all care and brought to man's estate, should be ungrateful to you and should leave you and go to another, whom perhaps he may have seen to be richer and should show, him to, and should show to him the honor that he owed to you and through hope of greater profit should deny his birth and refuse your parental rights. Would this seem to you right or immoral? Then Achilla answered, It is manifest to all that it would be immoral. Then Kepha said, If you say that this would be immoral among men, how much more so is it in the case of Yahuwah, who above all men is worthy of honor from men, whose benefits we not only enjoy, but by whose means and power it is that we begin to be when we were not, and whom, if we please, we will obtain from him to be forever in Baraka, or blessedness. In order, therefore, that the untrustworthy may be distinguished from the trustworthy, and the obedient from the disobedient, it has been permitted to the immoral one to use those arts by which the affections of everyone towards the true father may be proved. But if there were in truth some strange 
Elohim, were it right to leave our own Elohim who created us and who is our father and our maker and to pass over to another. Yahuwah forbid, said Aquila. Then said Kepha, how then will we say that the immoral one is the cause of our sin when this is done by permission of Yahuwah? that those may be proved and condemned in their day of judgment, who, allured by greater promises, have abandoned their duty towards their true father and creator. While those who have kept the true, or sorry, when those who have kept the belief and the love of their own father, e even with poverty, if so it has befallen, and with tribulation, may enjoy heavenly gifts and immortal dignities in his Malkuth, or kingdom. But if we will expound, sorry, but we will expound these things more carefully at another time. Meantime, I desire to know what Simon did after this. <clears throat> and Nasita answered, when he perceived that we had found him out, having spoken to one another concerning his crimes, we left him and came to Zakai, telling him those same things that we have now told to you. But he receiving us most kindly and instructing us concerning the belief of our Yahuwah or Master Yahushua Mashiach, enrolled us in the number of the trustworthy. Now, quite often in the common scriptures, where it says Master Yahushua Mashiach, it should say the Father's name where it has Master. It literally is supposed to be Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach. And that's one of the things that there, it, there isn't a single translation I've found that actually does that correctly. But you can find it. It's written in a few places in this manuscript. And it's also, if you look at what's called the Nomnia Sacra, it, it's sacred names in Latin, and you can just, if you even read the Wikipedia entry, it will tell you very plainly that for a long time, the Greek manuscripts would use code words, or what they call placeholders, two or three letter, Greek letters with a line over them, and then those letter combinations would represent different words from the Hebrew that you would say instead of a Greek word because the Greek could not properly transliterate Yahushua or Yahua. And they did not want to use the, the Greek words for mighty one, Theos or Di, Dios or things of that nature when speaking of Yahua Elohim. So they would use the placeholder whenever they were talking about Yahuwah, and then they would use just the normal Greek word when talking about false mighty ones, because it didn't matter. And they did the same thing for Mashiach, for Yahuwah, Yahushua, the word for Ruach, as opposed to spirit. It was spirit when it's speaking of anything else, and Ruach when speaking of Yahuwah's Ruach. Upright like the stake or an upright man, what we'd say yashar in Hebrew. And then you'd also have the word for man, like Adam, as opposed to normal man, also Dawid or beloved. These were all, there was more, but those were all placeholders that they'd use throughout the scriptures, Old Covenant and New Covenant writings. And when you looked at what the placeholders actually meant, and you looked in the New Covenant writings, our Mashiach is called Yahuwah all over the place. And it's something that's completely hidden in the common scriptures today. <clears throat> so I quite often will say Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach when I'm doing that. I don't mean to do it all the time, especially because it is written in here. He's at least twice it's being preached that you have to call on and be immersed in the name of Yahuwah, Yahushua. So, um, I don't know if that was originally right here as well, but I just wanted to make that point. At some time, we can actually go over those, and I've shared them before with, I believe, some of them, some, some of you all in here, but I'll share with you again. There's a brother named Yahukanon Robertson, 
on Facebook. And in 2000, I believe it was starting in 2012, but definitely 2013, he started putting together notes on Facebook showing the Greek manuscripts, showing the translation of it and the, the proper interpretation of the placeholder and an accurate translation of the text for most of the renewed covenant writings and showing unequivocally that our Mashiach was given the name above every name. He is not his own father, but he was named after him. So, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is something you can even see in the common scriptures, Genesis or Bereshit chapter 19. Yahuwah received fire and sulfur from Yahuwah from the Shemaim. That's explained by Irenaeus and against heresies of our Mashiach receiving power and authority and judgment from the Father above. In another place, you see it's Yahuwah that wrestles with the Yaakov. It's Yahuwah that Abraham sees and washes the feet of and dines with, and no one's ever seen the Father. So these things are alluded to. It's plainly said in other places. And then if you take the time to study it out, if you look into these things, you, it's literally all over the place, but it's hidden because the truth is hidden and it's veiled in love, as we'll read later on here. But to continue, sorry about that. It says, but he receiving us most kindly and instructing us concerning the belief of our master, Yahushua Mashiach, enrolled us in the number of the trustworthy. When Nisita had done speaking, Zakai, who had gone out a little before, entered, saying, It is time, Kepha, that you proceed to the disputation. For a great crowd collected in the court of the house is awaiting you, in the midst of whom stands Shimon, supported by many attendants. <clears throat> then Kepha, when he heard this, ordering me to withdraw for the sake of prayer, for I had not yet been washed from the sins that I had committed in ignorance. And he couldn't pray with them because he still had demons that were attached to him through idolatry. All right. He also could not eat with them until he was immersed and, and anointed in the name. So this is something that we should be mindful of. But it says, for I had not yet been washed from the sins that I had committed in ignorance. He said to the rest, Brothers, let us pray that Yahuwah for his unspeakable mercy, or chesed, through his Mashiach, would help me going out on behalf of the deliverance of men who have been created by him. Having said this and having prayed, he went forth to the court of the house in which a great multitude of people were assembled. And when he saw them all looking intently on him in, proud, in profound silence and Shimon the magician standing in the midst of them like a standard bearer, he began in the manner following. And this is titled the Malkuth of Yahuwah and his righteousness. Kef is going to give an interpretation of what our Mashiach meant by having him desire shalom for everyone through the, the beginning of this discourse. And I think it's amazing. It's also something that we have to do as believers in sincerity, in ruach and truth. If we want to do his will, this is how we come to what is true by being at shalom with one another and discussing, disputing the truth until it becomes evident. So here you'll see it right here. And then you'll see an example of Kepha doing that through the course of their, their disputations while Simon, the magician, does contrary adversarial satanic things. And you get to see a very big contrast between being loving towards even those who hate you and then being, being like Satan. <clears throat> So right here, this is Kepha speaking. It says, Shalom be to all of you who are prepared to give your right hands to truth. For whoever are obedient to it or him seem indeed themselves to confer some favor upon Yahuwah. 
whereas they do themselves obtain from him the gift of his greatest bounty, walking in his paths of righteousness. So the first duty of all is to inquire into the righteousness of Yahuwah and his kingdom, his righteousness that we may be taught to act rightly, his kingdom that we may know what is the reward appointed for labor and patience, in which Malkuth, or kingdom, there is indeed a bestowal of ageless Tob things upon the good, but upon those who have acted contrary to the will of Yahuwah, a worthy infliction of penalties in proportion to the doings of every one. Or in another way, everyone gets according to the, what they deserve, right? It becomes you, therefore, while you are here, that is, while you are in the present life, to ascertain the will of Yahuwah, while there is opportunity also of doing it. For if anyone, before he amends his doings, desires to investigate concerning things that he cannot discover, such investigation will be foolish and ineffectual. For the time is short, and the judgment of Yahuwah will be occupied with deeds, not questions. Therefore, before all things, let us inquire into this, what or in what manner we must act that we may merit to obtain ageless life. <clears throat> For if we occupy the short time of this life with vain and useless questions, we will without doubt go into the presence of Yahuwah. So, for if we occupy the short time of this life with vain and useless questions, we will without doubt go into the presence of Yahuwah empty and void of good works. And if you want to see more about going into the presence of Yahuwah after you die, you'll want to go and read 4th Ezra or 2nd Esdras chapter 7. It's a very long one, but it goes over both for the, the wicked and the righteous what happens to your inner being after the body's death. You're literally brought before the presence of the Father. And based on how you were in life, you're either confounded and and terrorized about the prospect of your future or you're at rest and and content and joyful at the prospect of your future and then after a week's time you're taken to your habitation until the resurrection that you'll be a part of but getting back here <clears throat> it says for or when, as I have said, our works will be brought into judgment, for everything has its own time and place. This is the place, this the time of works, the world to come, that of recompenses, that we may not therefore be entangled by changing the order of places and times. Let us inquire in the first place, what is the righteousness of Yahuwah? So that, like persons going to set out on a journey, we may be filled with good works as with abundant provision, so that we may be able to come to the Malkuth of Yahuwah as to a very great city. For to those who think aright, Yahuwah is manifest even by the operations of the world that he has made, using the evidence of his creation. And this is something that we're going to see as we go later on as he's preaching and later on as Clement, Aquila, and Nasita are speaking and, and doing preaching in front of them. They actually demonstrate using creation and reason to prove the existence of our maker. And it's very simple. It's pretty amazing stuff. This is... And therefore, since there ought to be no doubt about Yahuwah, we have now to inquire only about his righteousness and his Malkuth. 
But if our mind suggests to us to make an inquiry or any inquiry concerning secret and hidden things before we inquire into the works of righteousness, we ought to render to ourselves a reason, because if acting well, we will merit to obtain deliverance, then going to Yahuwah chaste and clean, we will be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and will know all things that are secret and hidden without any cavailing of questions. Whereas now, even if anyone should spend the whole of his life in inquiring into these things, he not only will not be able to find them, but will involve himself in greater errors, because he did not first enter through the way of righteousness and strive to reach the haven of life. And this is something that he explains plainly in other places, and it's also in the common scriptures. It's the doing of the things that we know that he said to do that makes him dwell with you. And he is comprehension. He is mightiness, intelligence, power, cleverness, insight, foresight, knowledge. He is the literal embodiment of these things, and he will dwell with you when you obey him through his ruach which then you'll know all these things so it's a catch-22 you can't know until you do it and until you do it you won't know <clears throat> excuse me righteousness what is it or what it is rather and therefore i advise that his righteousness be first inquired into that pursuing our journey through it and placed in the way of truth, we may be able to find Yahushua running not with swiftness of foot, but with goodness of works, and that enjoying his guidance, we may be in no danger of mistaking the way. For if under his guidance we will merit to enter that city to which we desire to come, all things concerning which we now inquire we will see with our eyes, being made, as it were, heirs of all things. Comprehend, therefore, that the way is this course of our life. The travelers are those who do good works. The gate is Yahushua, of whom we speak. The city is the Malkuth in which dwells the Almighty Father, whom only those can see who are of pure heart. Let us not then think the labor of this journey hard, because at the end of it there will be rest. For Yahushua himself also from the beginning of the world, through the course of time, hastens to rest. I, that is another admonition that where our Mashiach says, My father labors until now, and I labor when he was refuting the Pharisees and scribes about their complaining that he was doing healings on the Shabbat. But the point was, it was still within the 6,000 years where the works of Elohim are in fact being manifest in creation, which you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter one, Yobelim chapter two, and you lined those up with the Aleph bet and the patriarchs, the, the, the 22 names, one Adam through Jacob, and it all tells the parable in parable form, history before it happened. It's literally foretelling the future in the creation account. So the more you look at that, the more you see, but here's another admonition for that. He hastens to rest, meaning he's laboring until the millennial reign. <clears throat> For Yahushua himself also from the beginning of the world through the course of time hastens to rest. For he is present with us at all times, and if at any time it is necessary, he appears and corrects us, that he may bring to ageless life those who obey him. Therefore, this is my judgment, as also it is the pleasure of Yahushua, that inquiry should first be made concerning righteousness by those especially who profess that they know Yahuwah. 
If therefore anyone has anything to propose that he thinks better, let him speak. And when he is spoken, let him hear, but with patience and quietness. For in order to this, at the first, by way of salutation, I prayed for shalom to you all. To this, Shimon answered, We have no need of your shalom. For if there be shalom and concord or unity, we will not be able to make any advance towards the discovery of truth. For robbers and debauchees have shalom among themselves, and every immorality agrees with itself. And if we have met with this view, that for the sake of shalom we should give assent to all that is said, we will confer no benefit upon the hearers. But on the contrary, we will impose upon them and will depart chavarim, or friends. So do not invoke shalom, but rather battle, which is the mother of shalom. And if you can, exterminate errors. And do not seek for friendship obtained by unfair admissions. For this I would have you know, above all, that when to fight with each other, then there will be shalom when one has been defeated and has fallen. And therefore fight as best you can and do not expect shalom without war, which is impossible. Or if it can be obtained, show us how. Mm, Hey, hold on. I got a question for you in there. That's interesting. No problem. What's up? And And therefore fight as best you can and do not expect shalom without war. Which is impossible if we can't can be attained. Show us how. That's interesting. I, I that's a worldly. Uh, I thought it was a worldly phrase, but it said there is no victory, and guess there's a, unless there is a, a defeat. And I guess that's what he's saying right here. Right. That's that, evil. That's Simon the magician speaking, though. You remember? Oh, all right. Okay. All right. I, no, you're gotcha. you're right. You were right with your inclination there. You're about to see how it's not right. So <laughs> that was a good catch, though. Okay. It's not right in what way? That that we should war if we got a battle against evil? Is that what you're talking about? Or the opposite of that? <laughs> the opposite. See, Simon oh. is saying that you can't really have shalom until you duke it out. And then whoever wins, he's saying might makes right. Right, basically. right. Okay. So now you get to see Kefa's response. It says, go to this... It. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. I said, go for it. Let me go ahead, continue reading. All right. So it says, to this Kefa answered, Hear with all attention, O men, what we say. Let us suppose that this world is a great plain, and that from two states whose Melikim or kings, sovereigns, are at variance with each other, two generals were sent to fight. And suppose the general of the good king gave this counsel, that both armies should without bloodshed submit to the authority of the better Melek, whereby all should be safe without danger. But that the opposite general should say, no, but we must fight that not he who is worthy, but he who is stronger may reign with those who will escape. Which I ask you, would you rather choose? I doubt not, but that you would give your hands to the better king with the safety of all. And I do not now desire, as Shimon says that I do, that assent should be given for the sake of shalom to those things that are spoken amiss, but that truth be sought for with quietness and order. For some, in the contest of disputations, when they perceive that their error is confuted, immediately begin, for the sake of making good their retreat, to create a disturbance and to stir up strifes, that it may not be manifest to all that they are defeated. And therefore, I frequently entreat that the investigation of the matter in dispute may be conducted with all patience and quietness, so that if perchance anything seem to be not rightly spoken, 
it may be allowed to go back over it and explain it more distinctly. For sometimes a thing may be spoken in one way and heard in another, while it is either advanced too obscurely or not attended to with sufficient care. And on this account, I desire... Now, that might seem weird to you, but he's saying it might not be spoken well enough by the one doing the speaking, or the one listening might not be paying attention well enough to hear correctly, right? And right. on this account, I desire that our conversation should be conducted patiently, so that neither should the one snatch it away from the other, nor should the unseasonable speech of one contradicting interrupt the speech of the other, and that we should not cherish the desire of finding fault, but that we should be allowed, as I have said, to go over again what has not been clearly enough spoken, that by the fairest examination, the knowledge of the truth may become clearer. For we ought to know that if anyone is conquered by the truth, it is not he that is conquered, but the ignorance that is in him, which is the worst of all demons. I'll say that again. For we ought to know that if anyone is conquered by the truth, it is not he that is conquered, but the ignorance that is in him, which is the worst of all demons so that he who can drive it out receives the palm of deliverance. The opposite of ignorance is knowledge, and the knowledge is what our Yahushua is. If you know, you can read it in Proverbs 8, amongst other places. So in, uh, I'm trying to understand, it. is he talking about two nations, one nation against the next, or individual, uh, one person to another person? I'm, you know, I'm looking at, uh, uh, how, how, how can you, uh, let's say we got two nations. We got one nation that's seeking peace and the other one is pretending to seek peace, but really has evil motives. How are we supposed to talk, how are we supposed to be talk things out, you know? I, I, that, that's, that's my question is how do we, how are we supposed to defend ourselves against say one nation to another one that, when we're trying to do the righteous thing? Because, you know, I'm thinking about Lexington. Yeah, exactly. That's how you do it. Uh, well, like, d describe that. You know, I, like, look, look, I'm thinking about the, uh, I was reading in the, in the common law, and this has something to do with it. Uh, I was reading in the common law how the, 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 um, the revolution before the revolution, how uh, there was, I believe, some governor or whatever it was, was, or mayor, I forget what it was, that was doing a very unfair, unconstitutional uh, act. And 4,126 farmers came with rifles and said, you need, to res you need to resign right now because this ain't right. So I'm saying to myself, like, okay, um, was that wrong? Or was the guy resigned and, and, he, and he went back to England that gig. But uh, so you get what I'm saying? So what is Peter saying here? I, I don't, what's, what's right? You know, was that right what they did? You know, I'm, that's why I always have my inclination growing up in the five boroughs is if do the right thing but if you don't do the right thing we're gonna have a brawl you know that and i'm trying to get rid of that so that's what i'm praying to get rid of that so that that's where i'm at that's what i'm trying to get some clarity on well um that incident that you're recalling or bringing up where four thousand men were farmers were incited to storm uh, a fort and overthrow it and then make that man resign after stealing the gunpowder that was taken. It was because of that. But th it, these men were pious, righteous believers. And I want to give you the example there. That was Patrick Henry that did a sermon that it, it, and went around to incite those men to go do that, by the way. Okay. What it, yeah. What had happened is scripture says to be subject to every institution of man. The, the government that we have is the common law. It is the, the, the scriptures, which is the, the, the people ruled by consent of the governed, right? They have, right. they have laws, they have rules. And it was a foundational law. It was an unalienable right to defend yourself. 
So when the government, when they were taking the gunpowder and locking it up and hiding it, that was criminal offense on that part. He was breaking contract, no longer doing their responsible part as as the government that they were allowed to do by the consent of the people. And so he put a stop to that. It's no different than Fienhaus seeing the error that was being prevalent and spearing someone to keep the truth. Right now, right. it was no different than the, the Maccabees rising up to zealously guard the law and, and administered the persecution or judgment against those that were breaking it. Very similar. Um, in, in that same way, what Kef is saying is, that, and this is how we should be all the time, we have to be mindful of the plank in our eye before we can help others with their splinter. So it's never about what others are doing. It's always about the course of action that we should take as a believer. And the believer's course of action is peace, is sh shalom, with, at, if at all possible, with all men. Right but at least amongst yourselves and to be at Shalom in inner being to not let the things happening, have an effect on you. Right. So that's the, that's the goal to do that or to be contrary. That's the thing. You're either going to be of the adversarial spirit or of our creator's Ruach of love or of contrary things. And this is the parable that Kef is giving here between the two kingdoms. He's not saying what, oh, well, they, everyone would want to do what would cause no death for harm for anyone, except for evil men that, that want to rule through power, right? Yeah. It's just like yeah. Kepa says in his epistle that, or sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, but what do you, if you become an imitator of the good, who's doing evil to you, Right. I'm just trying to uh, draw a parallel to what's going on. I'll give you, you know, right. The, the example of Lexington. All right. John Knox and it's scriptural. You, you cannot be in wars of aggression. You can't be out attacking others, taking their stuff and doing pillaging and things like that. True. It's evil, Right. but you can defend yourself and defense of a righteous cause is the only way to have permissible combat. So when these usurpations and these violations were happening, these men knew that they had to stand for it, but they couldn't fight their brother. And that's what they did in Lexington. They stood before the assembly on the field at Lexington while they got mowed down by the British because they, they had to stand against the usurpation of what was right, but they weren't going to attack them. So they were martyrs for the truth. They were mowed down. They did one return volley, and then the war started because they were righteously defending themselves after that point. But it's the same thing you see in the Maccabees. You had the apostasy of the people, the chaos that ensued because of it with Antiochus coming in, and then it was the martyrs. You had appropriation from righteous men dying and holding to the truth, and then they could defend themselves. It is a very similar picture. And this is something that was established by John Knox before it was, it was known by the colonists in colonial America and implemented during that time when brother was against brother, Ephraim against Menashe in that instance. All right. So where were we? We were down here. I'm sorry about that. Four. Yeah, for we ought to know that if anyone is conquered by truth, it is not he that is conquered, but the ignorance that is in him, which is the worst of all demons, so that he who can drive it out receives the palm of deliverance. For it is our purpose to benefit the hearers, not that we may conquer badly, but that we may be well conquered for the acknowledgement of the truth. For if our speech is acuted by the desire of seeking the truth, even although we will speak anything, not quite rightly, or anything imperfectly. I was waiting for you to scroll. I was just trying to do this. Sorry. Anything imperfectly through man's frailty, 
Yahuwah in his unspeakable tobim or goodness will fill up secretly in the comprehensions of the hearers those things that are lacking. And this is another confirmation that it's the father that brings comprehension to the heart. And if he doesn't draw you, you cannot comprehend the truth, period. For he is righteous and according to the purpose of everyone, he enables some to find easily what they seek, while to others he renders obscure even what is before their eyes. Since then, the way of Yahuwah is the way of Shalom. Let us with Shalom seek the things that are Yahuwah's. If anyone has anything to advance in answer to this, let him do so. But if there is no one who desires to answer, I will begin to speak, and I myself will bring forward what another may object to me, and will refute it. Brother, I just I got to interrupt. Uh, I, I have to go. I have to stop oh. sharing. No problem. When Kepha, or when therefore Kepha had begun to continue his discourse, Shimon, interrupting his speech, said, Why do you hasten to speak whatever you please? I understand your tricks. You wish to bring forward those matters whose explanation you have well studied, that you may appear to the ignorant crowd to be speaking well. But I will not allow you this subterfuge. Now, therefore, since you promised as a brave man to answer to all that anyone chooses to bring forward, be pleased to answer me in the first place. Then Kepha said, I am ready, only provided that our discussion may be with Shalom. Then Shimon said, do not you see, O simpleton, that in pleading for shalom, you act in opposition to your master, and that what you propose is not suitable to him who promises that he will overthrow ignorance? Or if you are right in asking shalom from the audience, then your master was wrong in saying, I have not come to send shalom on earth, but a sword. For either you say well and he not well, or else if your master said well, then you not at all well. For you do not understand that your statement is contrary to his, whose Talmud you, or taught one you profess yourself to be. And if you remember, Kepha just went over what you should or shouldn't do when having discussions, that you shouldn't go to try to trip up someone in their conversation or to look at ways to, to win a victory and instead to patiently hear to get the sense of what they're trying to convey. So over and over, you'll see that Kepha does the very things that our Mashiach enjoins for him to do, and Simon does adversarial things that, that is satanic, like I had mentioned earlier, the things that the Yahuwah hates from the Proverbs, or what you can see sons of Belial all doing, right? So it's an interesting contrast. Then Kepha, neither he who sent me did amiss in sending a sword upon the earth, nor do I act contrary to him in asking shalom of the hearers. But you both unskillfully and rashly find fault with what you do not comprehend. For you have heard that the master came not to send shalom on earth, but that he also said, Baruch or prosperous are the shalom makers. For they will be called the very sons of Yahuwah, you have not heard. So my sentiments are not different from those of the master when I recommended Shalom, to the keepers of which he assigned Baraka, or blessedness. Then Shimon said, in your desire to answer for your master, O Kepha, you have brought a much more serious charge against him. If he himself came not to make shalom, yet enjoined upon others to keep it, where then is the consistency of that other saying?
All right, so we'll finish this if we can real quick. It says, Then Shimon said, In your desire to answer for your master, O Kepha, you have brought a much more serious charge against him if he himself came not to make shalom, yet enjoined upon others to keep it. Where then is the consistency of that other saying of his? It is enough for the taught one to be as his master. All right. And we're going to have to pause for weather and time constraints, but we'll continue this next time. And we greatly appreciate having you all here. So thank you for your time. And thank you for everyone that's going to listen. You all have a wonderful Shabbat and the Shavua Tob or the Tob week ahead of you. Thank you. And bye for now.